In this video, we'll talk about the information processing system and reading. We'll talk about things like um, working memory, long-term memory, and how that operates, and how that can inform your approach to reading instruction, both for English-only learners as well as for English language learners, second language learners. So here are some general principles that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, there is a limited capacity to our mental system, our cognitive system, our mind. Um, the amount of information that can be processed by the system is constrained in some very important ways, and we'll talk about that. It's constrained by things like sensory input, our ability to process um, a certain amount of sensory input at a given time, our working memory, and our storage capacity inside our brain, as well as our ability to access uh, what we have stored. Um, there's a control mechanism that, that is required to oversee the encoding, taking in, um, the transformation and the processing, as well as the storage and utilization of information in the brain. Uh, we have what's thought of as an executive function within our mind, theoretically, that oversees this process um, and helps us to use it in a strategic way. This also gets into issues such as metacognition. When one is learning a new task, um, such as new tasks related to reading and writing, um, or is confronted with a new challenge, uh, then we need more processing power in order to accomplish that task. So here are some further general principles. Uh, we use information that we gather through our senses. Uh, this is often thought of as bottom-up processing. What do we take in through our senses? Then from bottom up, we take information through our senses, we process it through working memory, then eventually it is stored through long-term memory. We use information that we have stored in memory um, in a purposeful way. This process is two-way, so we take information and we utilize that information from our memory to communicate. We construct meaning about our environment in relationship to the environment. It's an active process. Here are some further general principles. People are genetically prepared uh, to process and organize information in st specific ways. But just because we are genetically prepared to do it doesn't mean that we don't adapt by our environment. So it is both genetic as well as environmental in terms of our communication. Language development is similar in all human infants, regardless of language spoken by adults or the areas in which they live. That being said, that doesn't mean that once we start uh, to function within our environments, there aren't some environmental differences that also develop. All human infants with normal hearing babble and coo. They generate first words. They begin to use telegraphic speech, such as ball gone, and they overgeneralize um, using go to the store, for instance, uh, instead of went to the store at about the same ages. So that's what we mean by their similarities in language. Substitute the, those words and those generalities into a slightly different grammar um, and different words in a different language and you would have same general principles even if I was using a different language to explain it. Cognitive processes are critical in determining what is learned. Learning is an internal process within the brain that may or may not result in behavioral change. Inferences can be drawn about cognitive processes by observing how people respond to specific stimuli. Remember, we're not mind readers when we, t oh, when we try to figure out what a student has learned, but we can take notes based upon changed behavior. Some learning processes are specific to humans. People are actively involved in their own learning. People are selective about the things that they process and the things that they learn. Remember, we're constantly deluged with all kinds of sensory input, but we make selective choices about what we pay attention to at any given time. Right now, there's all kinds of potential sensory input that's taking 
place all around me, my air conditioner, um, the lights around me, possible noise from outside my door, uh, things that can be going on all, all over the place, little tiny noises within this apartment. But I have to be selective in what I pay attention to in order to make this video. Same thing goes for students when they are selective as they read. People impose their own meaning on environmental events. Uh, we interpret, we construct our own understandings and our own knowledge of our environment. No two people necessarily make the exact same conclusions because we all have different prior knowledge. This is a constructivist approach to learning and to memory when we talk about um, information processing in this particular video. The construction of our knowledge from our own experiences, in other words. We talk about the stage model of information processing. One of the major issues in cognitive psychology is the study of memory. The stage theory proposes that information is processed and stored in three stages, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. I'm sure that most of you have probably heard of that by now. First, let's talk about sensory memory. Um, in sensory memory, the environment makes available a variety of sources of information, light, sound, smell, heat, cold, but the brain only understands electrical energy. The body has special sensory receptor cells that change from one form of energy to another. This external energy is something the brain can understand. In the process of transduction or change, a memory is created. Within sensory memory, sensory memory is a temporary storage place, kind of like a holding place of unanalyzed information. We store, it, we store information in sensory memory very, very brief amounts of time, less than one half of a second for vision, um, about three seconds when it comes to hearing. That tells you something though, we, um, what passes through our vision passes very fast compared to what we hear. In, then once it passes through sensory memory, it enters into short-term memory, sometimes also referred to as working memory. Short-term memory refers to holding information in conscious awareness for a short period of time. It is the result of attending to an external stimulus in internal thought or possibly both. Initially, it lasts somewhere around 20 to 30 seconds, unless it is repeated of, of, because of rehearsal, for instance. And you can rehearse your short-term memory so that you're able to hold information in short-term memory for longer periods of time, at which point um, it can be available for up to 20 minutes with rehearsal. Short-term memory, um, another major limit in information processing is that short-term memory um, can only be stored, stored for a short amount of time and it can only process a limited uh, bits of information at a particular time. You've heard of uh, the number as seven plus two, uh, sometimes five plus two, bottom line is a very short amount of information at a given time. We have to get information from sensory memory into short-term memory. Individuals are more likely to pay attention to a stimulus if it has some sort of information, uh, interesting feature, if we're interested in what we're reading, or if it's colorful, or if it's memorable. Individuals are more likely to pay attention if the stimulate activates in some known pattern. Um, known patterns, circles, squares, things that we find visually appealing. There's a call uh, to mind relevant to prior learning. Um, because of the variability in how much individual, individuals can work with, it is necessary to point out important information. So this gets into being strategic in what you read and strategic in what you think about.
we get into how do you retain information in short-term memory. This gets into organization as well as repetition, practice, skill, drill. Um, a component, part to whole, is a part of it. Classification of information by categories or concepts, mnemonic devices. Um, the sequential storage, chronological, cause and effect, building to a climax. Relevance matters in terms of storage. Do you find it meaningful? Do you find it socially or personally interesting? Is there some sort of unifying theme? Um, is it connective to other information relation, related to uh, words or phrases uh, that you already know? Can you chunk information? Um, Roy G. Biv, for instance, with colors. A repetition must be done after forgetting begins. Then once information passes from short-term memory, it enters into long-term memory. Visual imagery, for instance, a mental picture can be extremely beneficial for, for reinforcing information to be recalled. You want to encourage students to form visual images that capture what they learn. If you're working with second language learners, this strongly implies that visuals, imagery, especially that they can relate to from their own culture will help second language learners in the learning process. Present ideas in a visual manner, pictures, charts, and graphs help students to process information into long-term memory. We get into coding. Um, for instance, numbers, rhyme schemes, um, rhyming with songs and phrases. Semantically coding refers to what meaning, remember semantic process, meaning making process, what meaning we give to the information that we are storing. And we can make, make meaning through numbers, rhymes, songs, for instance, along with other means. Uh, we get into how does something get stored in long-term memory in a meaningful way. This happens when you learn new information by relating it to previous learned information, especially if it's previous learned information that you already find interesting. It can be promoted in the classroom through, through helping students make multiple connections uh, between new information and prior knowledge. Repeated multiple times help students encounter the new information in visual, linguistic, um, visual audio ways, for instance. Encourage students to learn new information by making it practical to them, useful to them, and multisensory. Elaboration can make a big difference to students. Expanding on new information based upon what you already know. This is beneficial in enhancing learning. We get into long-term memory still with the knowledge base. Uh, we want to be able to access information that is already in long-term memory. If we can relate new information to information that is already stored in memory, it will be a lot more easy uh, to learn that new information. In order to take uh, with schema theory, that means you're connecting to prior schema. In order to take advantage of one's knowledge base, that knowledge base must be relevant to current new information. Mnemonic devices help. Uh, these are memory aids designed to help individuals learn and remember information. Often these are beneficial when new information is difficult to learn. Mnemonics, uh, these, are or uh, these help organize the material to be remembered. It encourages elaborative processing and memorable imagery. Uh, for instance, all I have to do is take a look at uh, this picture on the page, it brings back memories to your prior birthday. It also helps me remember things about culture, um, Chinese culture in the, in the case of this. One little glance at this picture and a flood of information comes into my brain. 
Context-dependent learning is important. Physical and emotional context may be inadvertently coded as retrieval cues along with intended cues. For instance, um, when I look at this picture, I'm looking at, at uh, the one right here. Uh, it's a picture from a past Christmas uh, that I celebrated, and it can bring in mind all kinds of cultural information if I'm trying to remember uh, what to teach students about aspects of culture, but there might be all kinds of inadvertent um, retrieval, retrieval cues that also come to my mind related uh, to relationship with my wife or different aspects of culture that I don't want to think about or do want to think about in the context of what I'm describing or the uh, town home where I was living at the time in Midtown St. Louis, there can be all kinds of information, both purposeful as well as in inadvertent, that comes to mind. Recall is better when tested in the same context, physical or emotional, as in which learning took place. That's why oftentimes students might tend to do better if they are given a test in the same classroom. Um, with the picture uh, that you see on the screen, this one, if I'm tested about aspects of my childhood, if I go back to that same backyard where I was a child at the time in which this picture was taken in Idaho, I might have a flood of recall information come back to me from my child if, if someone is to test me on that. Um, the sights, smells, sounds of a similar location can help your memory recall. still on recall. Um, we've done all kinds of experimental evidence on this. Subjects or students learn, learn some sentences. Some sentences are studied twice as long as others. This gets into repetition practice. Subjects must discriminate sentences they learn from distractors. We need to be able to tell the difference between what you need to be focusing on what, and what's a potential distraction. Um, students can be tested for each sentence more than once with various intervening sentences. Results from the study, both the amount of study and how recently the information was accessed affect response. So recency, if you are tested fairly recently compared to when you learned something, that helps you. However, the amount of study matters only if the information was not recently accessed. So again, the more recently you learn something, the less you have to study it. Um, if you're studying something that um, you learned a long time ago, then it really helps to study. Working memory refers to simultaneously storing and processing the information that is needed during cognitive performances. Working memory is a context-specific transient perspective system, meaning that it, you can only store it for a limited amount of time. It provides for selective temporary pooling and manipulation of information necessary to process. Um, you plan, problem solve, learn, comprehension, language, and reasoning. You have a limited capacity to your working memory. The capacity of working memory should be viewed as operational capacity. Working memory is distinct from short-term memory and long-term memory in that it is context-specific and transient. Oftentimes, you remember me saying that short-term memory is often referred to as working memory. There is a little bit of a difference. Um, it can selectively access information from, one, from other memory systems. Working memory can remember processes and strategies involved in planning, monitoring, and organizing memory. And it can be used for future operations. We get into Badley's theory of working memory. Um, this is a model of working memory that involves three distinct subsystems. Phonological loop, that's a system that draws upon speech resources. Um, the visual spatial sketch pad. This is a parallel system akin to an artist's sketch pad uh, for stimuli that cannot be verbalized, such as spatial information. 
then you've got the central executive. This is a system responsible for supervisory uh, attentional co uh, control, cognitive processing, basically equivalent to metacognition. You have the articulatory loop. Uh, this involves rehearsal limitations are due to limits in how long it takes for verbal material to decay, not how many items we can store. Um, therefore, the faster we can rehearse, the more we can store. The articulatory loop is called the phonological loop due to evidence that involves in speech. We can rehearse about 1.5 seconds of verbal material before it decays. The time in the loop is not related to probability of coding. In other words, how much time it takes isn't so important as process and verbal material and um, speech. Badley's model proposes that we have a visual spatial sketch pad as well as a phonological loop. These hold information for use by the central executive metacognition. The central executive is a control system that mediates, builds a bridge between attention and regulation of processes occurring in working memory. However, we lack evidence of such a central executive in neuroscience. There are theoretical levels of processing theory. Um, learners can utilize different levels of elaboration as they process information. There is thought of as a continuum uh, from perception through attention to labeling and meaning making. All stimuli that um, activate a sensory receptor cell are permanently stored in memory. In other words, we never really forget, short of, of course, brain damage. Um, different levels of processing, called elaboration, continue to an ability to access that memory. So um, if you can elaborate, that helps you to recall. According to Bransford, um, when the demands of accessing information more closely match the methods used to elaborate or learn the information, more is remembered. Uh, their strength of memory depends upon how deeply information is processed, not how long um, it is processed. In other words, if we have a memory that is stored in a very deep, meaningful way, we can access that memory even if years has, have passed. This specific model views human memory as a byproduct of depth of analysis. Learning is thought of as a byproduct of comprehension. Then we have still levels of processing. Processing levels can be viewed as a continuum. At one extreme, uh, you only have a brief sensory analysis, a sight or a sound that gives rise to memory traces that are very transient in the mind and easily disrupted, easily um, disrupted, not able to re be recalled very well. At the other end of the continuum, uh, the process of deep semantic meaning-making analysis will lead to a more permanent memory, one that you can more easily recall. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully this was helpful to you when we talk about the information processing model. Have a good day.